All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the final plenary of this 2020 conference. Uh, I'm Dave Woods. I'm the program chair for uh, the 2020 conference. And it gives me really great pleasure to introduce our last keynote speaker, Professor Mark Drury. Mark is a computational statistician and he is a Sakurbi Lang Professor of Civil Engineering at the Department of Engineering at Cambridge. Uh, he is one of the original founding executive directors of the Alan Turing Institute. Um, and he's a strategic program director at Turing, where he established and continues the Lloyd Register Foundation Program in data-centric engineering. He's an elected fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, has held various uh, prestigious positions in the EPSRC, and uh, delivered various uh, prestigious talks, including the IMS Medallion Lecture at JSM 2017, the Benui Society Forum Lecture at the European Meeting of Statisticians, also in 2017. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Mark, who's going to talk about the sense and statistics of digital twins. Mark. Thanks very much, Dave. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me and I will share my screen with you now. Uh, hopefully you can see this. Yeah, all good. So, um, it's good that I am the final speaker because uh, I would consider uh, that you've had quite a substantial feast uh, of statistics uh, and data science during this, this week. So you should consider this talk as a, a sort of um, digestive after uh, the, great, uh, the great time that you've had. Uh, so this is something light uh, something fun, uh, but hopefully something uh, of interest. Now, what I want to talk about is this whole idea of digital twins. Um, we live in an age uh, of hype and excitement and breathless uh, announcements, um, and digital twins in many ways seems to be one of these um, uh, phrases that just seems to have emerged. Um, but I would actually argue that there is some real depth here uh, and for the statistical and for the data science uh, communities, um, there, there are some really exciting and um, you know, really important uh, developments that, that are going on. And so I want to talk about the sense of digital twins uh, and then just give, again, some very, very brief examples some of the statistical uh, developments that are going on within uh, digital twinning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of break things up. What's the digital component and what's the twin component? Well, the twin component is probably a fairly um, straightforward notion. Uh, you see here a picture of, of two twins. Uh, two girls who are twins and they are identical twins so they are genetically identical and the whole idea of twinning some sort of abstracted representation of a physical or a natural process or system to allow us to make predictions about the the reality uh, to make forecasts uh, and to control it um, is, is embodied in the whole notion of the idea of the twin. Now, what we see here are identical twins. And if we had an identical representa representation of some physical reality in a computer, um, then our job would pretty much be done. But of course, twins are not always identical. Uh, and you can see here, that although these uh, two characters are indeed twins, um, they certainly um, differ quite substantially. And yet at the very core, uh, they have, or they share uh, certain common elements. And if I think of the engineering professions and the engineering disciplines, they have taken this idea of the non-identical twin um, for quite some time and used it to great effect. So if I think, for example, of this, this image, this little video here of a model aircraft, a scale model um, um, jet aircraft here, which is in a, a wind tunnel, 
And what this allows is the aeronautical engineers who are designing and want to understand the characteristics, the performance uh, that is achievable from their, their design, they can use these miniature scale models in wind tunnels, they can instrument them, they can then run specific experiments to study aerodynamic response, structural performance, and give insights into what the expected performance of the actual jet would, uh, would be. Now this, of course, is going to be far more, far less expensive than taking the full-size jet up into the air and instrumenting that and, and doing the, the various experiments. And of course, it opens the door to testing to destruction. But the key here is that this experiment and the little twin uh, model is bespoke. Okay, once we've tested it to destruction, or if we want to make a change to the, the design of the, the large aircraft, that then needs to be reflected in the, the small aircraft itself. And of course, naval architects have done the same uh, in studying the hydrodynamics of the control stability uh, of ships. And I love these little models. I've always actually wanted one um, where you see them in, in the, you know, the, the large uh, test tanks. Um, again, all instrumented up, uh, gathering data, which can then be scaled appropriately to make uh, inferences about the performance uh, of the, the actual uh, ship itself. And we could go on and in structural engineering, those of you who studied it, uh, engineering at university probably remember making uh, stick-like structures and then hanging weights on them to see how they perform. This is a typical example of a physical twin, a miniature twin that captures the, the essence of the physical reality that we want to understand. And we can do, we can you know, test this to destruction. We can test it in harsh environments. Um, but again, it is a bespoke twin of the physical model, it generates data for that particular design, that particular structure. Of course, twinning is not um, just something that has been used in the engineering disciplines, but in the medical sciences and the health and, 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 and biological sciences, the whole notion of a, a model organism that enables scientists to study certain physiological characteristics within the human. Um, and, you know, the, the, the advances that have been made in medical science because of the Drosophila fly model or the, the mouse model, uh, as you see here, are quite significant. Now, for those of you who are still awake on Thursday afternoon uh, after the whole conference will immediately say, Mark, that isn't a mouse, it's actually a rat. Um, so full marks to those of you who noticed that that, in fact, was a a rat. But the key here is that even in the medical sciences, the twin, the twin physiological system, in this case, a, a living one, um, is, uh, is absolutely essential uh, to making advances and understanding um, the health or the genesis of certain types of disease uh, in, in the human. And of course, what this then starts to lead on to is the notion of the digital twin. I mean, clearly, uh, we would like to minimize the number of actual uh, animal tests or animal experiments, um, and which then leads on to the notion of the, the digital uh, representation or the, the digital avatar. And in fact, on that note, uh, talking about digital avatars, Samsung Star Laboratories, uh, only in January this year, introduced a range of what they call digital avatars, so videos that uh, are avatars and what they call AI-powered virtual beings that look and behave like real humans. 
The avatars, they're designed to hold conversations with us, to be able to be sympathetic, uh, like real people. Um, and really in order to, to act as hyper lifelike companions. And of course, the, the many technologies behind that, um, based on AI, machine learning, computational statistics, again, is all based on the notion that we can, we can obtain data uh, as to how actual humans converse, how they react, uh, and, and so on. But I want to kind of make the point here that this is nothing new. The whole idea of having a twin of the environment around us or of some physical system that, that we would like to understand better to predict its performance is nothing new. And in fact, if we go way back to the ancients in Greece, 100, 200 years BC, we see this mechanism which was discovered in a shipwreck off the Greek coast, uh, off the Greek island Antikythera. And it was discovered in 1901. And the mechanism itself dated back, as I said, to about 100, 200 uh, years BC. And it's an ancient analog computer. It was used to predict a future calendar of astronomical positions and eclipses, sometimes decades in advance. And of course, it included tracking the four year cycle of the ancient Olympic Games. Now, this analog computer, the clockwork mechanism, which was comprised of around about 30 bronze gears, they were programmed using the measured astronomical data which the ancients uh, used to, in inverted commas, uh, program the, uh, the Antikytherum. And it then allowed them to make predictions about when eclipses would come. And of course, eclipses at that time had, you know, real quite uh, significance and, and other astronomical phenomena. So the notion of a twin and a twin based on some sort of computation itself based on data gathered from observing the system that we want to understand is certainly nothing new. And if I go forward in time to the 1800s, what you see here is Lord Kelvin's mechanical predictor of tides. Kelvin built this in 1872, 1873, and it was created as a means of predicting the ebb and flow of sea tides. And the intention was to shorten and make more efficient the very laborious and error-prone manual computations uh, that were being used uh, at or up to that time uh, for tide prediction. And what Kelvin did, he took data, he took the measurements of the high and low tides and the ebb and flow of tides. And he then made an abstracted mathematical model based on this really exotic mathematics that was coming out of France at the time, Fourier analysis. And he developed a trigonometric system that was able to predict future tidal motion. Now, the computation involved um, was really quite prohibitive. And what Kelvin did in an ingenious way was designed, again, a mechanical analog computer, which allowed the computation of all of these trigonometric sums uh, to be obtained in an extremely fast and efficient way. And what you see in the lower left-hand corner is some paper wrapped around the drum. And as the computations um, proceed, the actual forecasts of the high and low tides against time are then drawn via 
the paper that was wrapped around that barrel. And predictions from that machine were valid at an hourly level, a daily level, and even a, a yearly level. And in essence, as I said, what Kelvin had done is taken observational data from tidal motion and developed the model, the formula, that would actually accurately reflect that data and created a machine, created a twin, if you will, of the tidal behavior. So it's a very early, I wouldn't say a digital twin, but it's certainly a very early analog twin. And the development of these machines continued right into the 20th century. And, and they were widely used in general uh, marine navigation, uh, and of course were strategically important um, for the military in both world wars. Let's jump ahead to the 1920s. From trying to forecast or predict tidal motion for the world that we live in to predicting the weather, well, this is nothing new. In 1749, Alexander Wilson, or Dr. Alexander Wilson, he attached thermometers to a kite and used that to gain data that allowed them to make predictions about what the weather system would be like in that particular region, say in an hour or two hours uh, ahead. In the 1920s, that basic principle had been continuing and meteorologists were then able to take the new technology that was emerging, which was radio technology at the time, and use radio transmitters, attaching them to the balloons and then releasing them into the atmosphere. And that allowed them to gather real-time data about the weather, the weather patterns in the upper altitudes. And then, of course, in the 1900s, Lewis Fry Richardson, the great natural philosopher, he developed the numerical means to solve the Navier-Stokes equations, which allowed one to make predictions about the ev evolution of a weather front. Now, although radio technology was available then, computing technology wasn't available and the only computers that were available were um, men and women who would work out a small piece of the, the overall computation. And so making a one hour ahead prediction uh, of a weather front was taking of the order of two or three days. So Fry Richardson was way ahead of his time but now, the Met Office, the supercomputers that they have, the um, advanced data science uh, that we have, the advanced networks of, um, of, of, of atmospheric sensors and so forth, provide this, this synthesis of data, mathematics, com computation into what we would now consider as the digital twin of the weather, the local weather systems, which allows us to make the, uh, those particular forecasts. Let's jump ahead to the 1960s. In the 1960s, the advent of digital computation um, was really starting to, to gather pace. And here we can see the Houston control room and how that amount of um, digital computation uh, was able to, to basically guide spacecraft into space, get it back to Earth, and then subsequently control and guide the spacecraft to the moon and back. A fantastic feat. And interestingly, the near disaster that could have happened with uh, Apollo 13 was averted primarily because they had a twin of the capsule on, um, or, or actually in Houston, and 
I'm sure you've all seen the film Apollo 13 numerous times and I don't need to retell the story. But what's interesting, if, if we focus on the technology, the, the enabling technology, is that one thing that, that, that really um, is synonymous with the notion of a digital twin are flight simulators. So in the 70s, you can see here the, the, the typical flight simulator uh, based on 1970s computing technology. And then in the top right, the flight simulators that we uh, are more accustomed to, to be at least being aware of uh, with the, the digital com uh, computing technology uh, that, that we have now. So what we're seeing is that from ancient times, observation of particular systems that, that, that are important to us to either understand and, and uh, predict how they will, they will react um, and even how to control them in the case of the design of ships or, or aircraft have all really started to, to benefit from the emergence of digital technologies. And indeed, if we go to the 1980s, the whole notion of a draftsman and technical drawings um, was completely revolutionized by what was at the time called computer-aided design, where designs could then be embedded within a computer and that geometry uh, could then be replicated in a, a very efficient way. And we'll see just shortly how that has developed uh, in, in the last 40 years. I mentioned AI, and of course IBM's Deep Blue vanquished the, uh, the great Russian chess player uh, for the very first time in the 90s. Um, using AI methodology uh, and, of course, the computing power that's needed to really drive that and to do the, the massive searches that AI technology uh, require, um, demands. And then only recently, the more complex game of Go was mastered again by an artificial intelligence or digital uh, computation. Uh, interestingly enough, now, one of the main enabling technologies for AlphaGo um, is Monte Carlo tree search. So I, I always uh, um, tease my AI colleagues that uh, you know they, they've all they, they always fall back on computational statistics when they've got any difficult problems that they need to they need to solve. So we've cantered from the ancient Greeks right up to modern day um, AI technologies and looked at how all of these different technologies, data gathering, mathematical modeling, computation, digital technology, all come together in defining digital twins. And what I want to do now is really just give you a few examples of digital twinning work um, that's going on at the Alan Turing Institute and really focus on the statistical components of that, which are absolutely paramount. I mean, whenever you are, are, are measuring data, there is all of the statistical methodology and all of the theoretical statistics uh, that's required for that. And when you want to then synthesize or assimilate that into some sort of mathematical model, um, then the whole notion or you know, many aspects of theoretical uh, st uh, statistics and um, things like machine learning uh, really come into play. And then of course, uh, when we want to solve some of these mathematical models and run them forward, like the um, meteorological uh, w weather models, the whole notion of numerical computation uh, comes, comes to the fore. And um, of course, in the conference uh, today, you had a whole session on uh, what's called, or what is known as probabilistic 
numerical computation. And it's an area that uh, we at the Alan Turing Institute have really been pushing forward um, where statistics and statistical methodology uh, lies four square at the heart of numerical computation. And if I give you an example, this is work that we are doing. It's funded by the British Heart Foundation and it's in collaboration uh, with St. Thomas's Hospital in, in London. Uh, we're working with teams of computer scientists, mathematical modelers, uh, and cardiolog cardiologists um, in developing di cardiac digital twins, where we develop mathematical models, the numerical computation that's required to solve these as efficiently as possible, and then to assimilate data. So the data here is the, is the video that you see uh, into these. Uh, and the rationale for this work, the motivation for this work, is to help guide clinicians uh, and surgeons in particular in planning um, clinical procedures, uh, cardiac uh, procedures. And in fact, only uh, a couple of years ago, we had a paper um, where we uh, used quasi Monte Carlo methods uh, to reduce the number of simulations that were required uh, to get uh, estimates, uh, statistically robust estimates of quantities of interest uh, as far as the cardiac function is concerned. Probably one of the, the main areas where digital twins seem to be causing quite an awful lot of froth and, and, and excitement uh, is in the built environment. And I alluded to that when I mentioned computer-aided design. And what you're seeing here is basically computer-aided design 40 years on. So you're seeing the geometry, not just of the buildings, not just of the transportation systems, the gardens, the, the interaction with the, the, uh, the, the natural environment. Um, but the whole urban setting as well. Now, this is the geometry. It captures the geometry. It also captures all of the component parts in each of these buildings. And so civil engineers and, and, and uh, construction engineers have become very excited about this um, and, and talk about this as their digital twins. But we can go even further we can now start to put the physics, the physics of the buildings, the physics of, you know, the, um, how the atmosphere, the air quality, how it interacts with the, the design of the air conditioning in the buildings, how the transportation systems will impact the flow of people uh, in these environments. And this becomes hugely exciting. And, and one thing that we've been doing uh, is looking at the uh, resilience uh, of design. So this is, th th this is an animation uh, showing a number of digital agents, uh, people, um, entering and exiting a tube station. And so, of course, what we can do here is we can take this digital twin of the tube station and people entering and exiting it, and we can run many different types of scenarios we can look at what happens if there, you know, if there is an emergency and we have to evacuate people. At what rates can we safely evacuate them? What happens if we can play lots, play out lots of what if scenarios? And look at the characteristics um, of the emergent behaviour uh, of 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 people and of people as they interact with the uh, the various characteristics of the design of of that station. And this is one of the really, uh, you know, I, I think very exciting uh, components or elements uh, of digital twinning um, in that, you know, we, we can really start to, to, to look at, at safety uh, and, 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 and look at, you know, those, those rare events that have really high consequences, you know, for example, a, a catastrophic fire or, 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 or something or a bomb being let or, and we can use these in planning uh, and, and making the, the, the appropriate um, 
decisions uh, in, in, in those cases. I want to move to a completely different area. Um, and this, this is a collaboration with the Turing Institute uh, in Cambridge. And what you see here um, is actually a, a virtual reality, if you will, of uh, which allows a designer to consider the impact that the design of a fan blade, so that's the large blades at the front of the engine, um, what the design impact is on the overall efficiency of the engine. And what we have here is the ability to take a number of design criteria and instantiate what the actual blade would look like, and then take that design and propagate it to the measurement of efficiency of the, the actual engine itself. Now, typically, what would happen is, is that a blade would be designed, it would then be incorporated into some sort of test rig and, and you know, experiments would be done and, and efficiencies would be measured. Again, these are all bespoke. So every time there's a new design, it has to be built, it has to be put in the test rig, it has to be run, extremely expensive. This sort of methodology, this digital twinning technology, enables us to look at multitudes of different types of designs and what their implications are on efficiency. Now, this is great, and, and, and Rolls-Royce, you know, they, they, they are using this, or, 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 well, they were up until March. Um, but let me, um, let me just dig down a little bit into what exactly is being done here, because it's clearly not magic, and it's clearly not simple. And in fact, um, there's a good dose of fairly modern day statistical modeling and statistical inference being used. So these are the, as I said, the fan designs for, for, the, uh, for, for, for the, the, the Rolls-Royce engines. And we want to get that mapping from the design of the fan blade to the actual efficiency of the engine itself. Now, what is it we do? Well, it's fairly straightforward to measure the overall efficiency of the engine, but it's, it's less obvious how to characterize the efficiency of subcomponents. And, um, and some of you might say, well, you've got computational fluid dynamics. And the reality is that the computational fluid dynamics really cannot capture the complex physics of turbulent flows um, that, that really dominate um, the, the performance of a, a, a jet engine. So what is the data that we actually get? Well, there are a small number of sensors on the turbine or the rakes of the, uh, the, the turbine blades, which are spatially distributed both circumferentially and radially. And these sensors enable us to take measurements of temperature and of pressure. And the efficiency of the engine can be obtained deterministically by knowing what the inlet and outlet pressures and temperatures happen to be, uh, along with the specific heat ratio. So one would think, well, we can just measure these. Well, we do measure them, but we only measure them at a small number of points. And what we really need is the integrated temperature, the integrated pressure across um, that whole area. And so you know, what you can see is that we are making small number of noisy measurements. And, uh, and what we would like to do is characterize that uncertainty and make predictions about the overall stagnation temperatures uh, and pressures. Uh, and, and the way that we do that 
um, is, is using Krigging uh, style methods, where we can now interpolate um, both circumferentially and radially and obtain the mean temperature uh, and pressure at every point um, on that, that radial and circumferential um, space. And in addition to that, the associated uncertainty uh, in those predictions. Uh, as you can see here, and many of and many statisticians use these training methods uh, for spatial uh, statistics in, in, in public health, for example, uh, among other things. And so this is something that we have been doing, um, the, 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 the team that, or one of the teams uh, in the data-centric engineering programme, um, computing these necessary integrals that are required uh, to, to come up with the efficiency uh, of the actual engine. Now, of course, I'm at a, a statistics conference, so I better put up a hierarchic Bayesian model. And this is exactly um, what it is that, 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 that is being used here. Um, so we have some uh, Gaussian process, which allows us to capture the circumfer circumferential variation the radial variation, and we use uh, various shrinkage priors uh, and so on. I, I won't go into the details, but suffice to say, there's a, fair, a fairly chunky amount uh, of statistical methodology uh, that is at play here. Now, what's exciting about this, of course, is that we can then start to propagate all of this um, not just on one particular uh, set of turbines, but right across from the low pressure, mid pressure to high pressure um, um, uh, areas uh, in the engine. And again, we can exploit the statistical regularities uh, from the sparse data that we obtain. Furthermore, we can now have a whole ecosystem of digital twins, if you will, where in essence we can have a hierarchic model um, of a whole fleet of engines. And this is something that um, aerospace companies are very excited about. And in fact, at, at the moment, Rolls-Royce are, are, are actually developing this um, for their, you know, to control their own fleets. So this is absolutely core for the, the, the benefit and, for, and, and to see the benefit uh, of digital twinning technology, um, obtaining data, using it to its, its most effective, running it alongside large computational models and then making inferences um, about components of the engine, about the overall performance of the engine, and then also about um, the whole fleet of engines. Another um, area that, that is really a lot of fun uh, is, is a, a project that, that we got involved with where a company in Amsterdam had developed a technology to allow them to 3D print stainless steel uh, structures at a, a really large scale. Um, and one day they decided probably after a few a few too many beers, let's print a bridge out of, uh, you know, let, let's, let's 3D print a, a stainless steel bridge. And furthermore, they convinced the city fathers of Amsterdam that this would be a, 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 a great achievement in terms of civic pride if it was to be used to span one of the canals uh, within Amsterdam. And they convinced the city of Amsterdam to do exactly that. Um, and then they woke up the next morning and um, they realized that the material properties of 3D printed steel, the structural properties of a, a load bearing structure that uses this new material uh, weren't really understood. And in terms of getting or passing the regulation, um, regulatory requirements of safety, uh, they were nowhere. 
And what we did at, um, at the Turing is we pulled together a team of structural engineers, materials engineers, statisticians, stochastic geometers, applied mathematicians, to all work together in characterizing this material, characterizing um, the actual structural properties. And what we did uh, is we placed a large number of sensors on the structure, gathered uh, the appropriate data, and we were then able to uh, build statistical models um, to assess the, um, the overall life performance and reliability uh, of the structure. The other thing, of course, that was quite exciting was that it motivated methodological development. The finite element method is a, 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 a classic mathematical approach to computationally solving partial differential equations. But there is no real natural way of embedding data from the actual physical system into the finite element solution. And so this motivated uh, our team to develop statistical uh, finite element methods. And so, so really what, what you see is advances, uh, not just in technology, but also advances in statistical methodology uh, and, and its partner, uh, applied mathematics. So very exciting. The final example I want to give you is, is work that uh, my team are doing um, with the Greater London Authority on measuring air quality. Um, if we go back to Lord Kelvin, you know, he said, if, you, if, if, if anything is to be improved, it has to be measured first. And along with Greater London Authority, it was agreed that um, ways of improving uh, the measurement of air quality were, were absolutely essential. And so uh, we have a, a team who are taking feeds from all of the weather stations, the large computational fluid dynamics models in, in, in the likes of uh, various universities, um, and coming up with statistical ways um, of getting better spatial temporal measurements uh, of air quality. In March, of course, when we went into lockdown because of COVID-19, we were asked, could we pivot and use the digital twinning technology uh, that had been developed for understanding and measuring air quality to better understand the levels of compliance of lockdown? And then subsequently to better uh, inform um, public policy um, as to how we would safely exit the lockdown. And so what this work is doing is looking at the busyness of London. And again, I will just very quickly fly through this because I'm talking to statisticians. Uh, I spoke to engineers um, a little while ago about this and had to spend more time on this. But basically what we have are spatial temporal scans of levels of activity within certain regions of London. And, and this data comes from uh, traffic cameras where we have segmented the video uh, into identifying people that are walking, uh, motor vehicles, uh, and, and so on. And then building up a whole data set, uh, a whole uh, spatial temporal data set on, on these, characterizing these levels of activity. And of course, the key question um, here was um, over a period of time, is there evidence to suggest that the activity is rising and to levels that um, are above those we would expect or want? Um, and of course, um, th there are methods um, based on scan statistics uh, for testing um, measured levels of activity, spatial temporally, uh, against a, a, a particular model. Again, I won't go through all of these details, um, but basically um, we end up with this time series analysis. It allows us um, to make tests and then to flag where uh, in London um, there, there are actually 
potential uh, deviations from expected levels of busyness. And, and that is being fed to GLA, which then goes to Public Health England. And, 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 and what you, you're given as output is a nice map of the levels of busyness at a particular uh, point in time and, and the levels of significance um, um, of those deviations from uh, what would be considered desirable. Of course, having this twin then allows us to simulate particular situations and what the implications may well be. Uh, and one of them um, happens to be uh, the simulation of surges uh, in traffic um, and exactly what uh, uh, we may be able to do um, in, in, in these particular cases. Now, we can, of course, scale all of this sort of activity up. I mentioned with the Rolls-Royce work, we scale up from one engine to a whole fleet of engines. And likewise, we could scale up from an urban level to a city level, to a regional level, to a national level. But these are almost moonshots. And for those of us who, you know, who work on the nuts and bolts um, of the computation, of the digital technology, of the data science, of the statistical science, we realize just how formidable a task it is. And many of you who perhaps worked in modeling in, 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 in COVID-19 understand some of these challenges um, uh, very acutely. But nevertheless, the opportunity is there and the future for the medical sciences, for the environmental sciences, for commerce, for business, for the engineering sciences, as far as the exploitation of digital twin technology is concerned, is fabulous. Um, and I'm really excited to be um, enjoying uh, my career at this time um, where we are able to integrate data with advanced computing technology and advances in mathematical and statistical modeling for the greater uh, good of, of mankind. So I'll stop there and um, thanks very much for listening. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen, I guess. Thank you very much, Mark. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, we have uh, a few questions which have come through, if you are happy to, uh, to answer those. Um, first up, a couple of related questions uh, from Emily Bebbington and Richard Sutherland about how do you decide which are the most important features to include in digital twin model and how many observations do you need to, to, to build that model? So in your tube station example, how many hours of footage would you have taken, how many people would have gone through? And then on a related point, how do you document the assumptions? So how do you make sure you understand what's not being modeled and don't put too much faith in that in the in model? So that that's that I mean that's a great question. And the you know, one always thinks that, you know, the digital twin should be like the identical twin. So if we are modeling a physical system, we want to put all of the physics into that in our digital representation. But the reality is, it really depends on what the question is that we're asking. So if you go back to Lord Kelvin's ebb and flow um, of the tides, well, an oceanographer would start with, well, we need to we need to model the you know the the the, the particular um, ocean environment. What is the level of salinity? How is that interacting with with various things? And you end up with this extremely complex model. But the reality is, there's only a couple of drivers that are um, dominant drivers. Um, governing the ebb and flow of the tides and that of course uh, is, is, is governed by um, you know the, the, the motion of the earth and so Kelvin was very clever in realizing you know all I need is the tri trigonometric sums to, to represent that. It bears no resemblance mechanistically to the reality but in terms of predicting what it is we want to know it works well and so for something complex um, like the uh, underground station. I mean, clearly with the underground station, then we really need to capture all of the geometry. You, 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 know, you know, 
what are the escalators like? What are their speed like? You know, what, 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 what are the spaces? That clearly is all very important. The question then is, um, you know, how many people and how many runs do we need before we can start to, to make um, statements that really stand up to statistical and evidential scrutiny? And that, of course, is the, you know, is always the big question. Now, the next thing, of course, is this, um, the, the second part of the question about things that you miss out, and I always like to, to refer to Donald Rumsfeld's known unknowns. So, you know, most statisticians are very familiar with known unknowns and how to model those. What we're not so f um, um, clever on is how do we encapsulate uncertainty associated with unknown unknowns and that radical uncertainty. And, and, and I think that, that, you know, that's one of these open questions. And, and there's, there's been work, you know, in the past, you know, some pioneering work by people like Tony O'Hagan and so on, um, in, in, you know, accommodating the fact that your computer model is misspecified. It, it you know, does not capture um, the, the essential components that, that, that are needed for the predictions or the forecasts um, or the analysis that, that that's required. I was wondering, do you think there's any any issues around trust with digital twins? I mean, we can sort of compare it to the the A level algorithm uh, fiasco recently, where essentially that that was meant to be a twin of the exam system and clearly performed under at least you know some metrics not up to scratch. So is, there, is there other issues around? actually getting people to trust the results. Right? Absolutely. And, and the, you know, the whole notion of the, the regulation and, and regulatory um, um, uh, practice as far as the, the use of these um, tools are concerned is, is, is going to be, um, you know, it, it, essential. You know, if, if, if I look at the, um, the MX3D uh, bridge, now, you know, people could, could get killed if that failed. And so the regulatory scrutiny of, you know, any predictions, any analysis that comes out of a, a, a digital twin um, is going to be absolutely essential. And, and so that, that is a, an important area that, that really needs to be developed yeah. alongside the, the technological uh, developments that, that, that are required. So one perhaps slightly tongue-in-cheek question for Richard Sutherland. Do you think that Dominic Cummings is building a digital twin of the UK, in which everything works as he thinks it should? Um, I, so from what I understand, um, he certainly seems to have got a bit frothy at the mouth with the whole notion of digital twins. Um, uh, and let's not, um, let's not discourage him, um, you know, given that uh, the comprehensive spending review is, is coming along. Um, however, you know, a digital twin of the UK um, you know, let, let's just think about how well we've done with digital twins of COVID-19. Um, let's just think of how well we've done with digital twins of macroeconomic indicators that the, the, the Bank of England uses. We, um, you know, we are miles away from, from anything like that, you know, where there is real complexity. Um, and, uh, so my answer is tongue in cheek. Uh, let, let, let's keep Dominic enthusiastic about them, but but we we should just be aware that we are very much at the start of, of a journey. This is not something that is uh, you know that that can be taken off the shelf and used uh, as a matter of course. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Mark. We'll wrap up there. A great way to end the, the conference.